I'd like to get a chance to shake your hand and get to know you better. And uh, we uh, like it when people come and pay us a visit, especially when their uh, family members come and, and they come and pay attention. They come and pay attention. But yeah, hopefully they pay attention. But they come and visit, pay us a visit. My tongue is tied this morning. A um, couple of things. Don't want you to forget that uh, we are going to have a little uh, party fellowship meal for our uh, senior singles who we love, and we're going to do a Valentine's Day thing for them. That's why the fellowship hall was so decorated uh, this morning, and whoever did it, whoever did the decorating did a really good job, really impressed with all that. So it's a time of some we pay tribute to our, to our uh, senior singles, and we're glad that we can do that for them. Um, also, uh, we also are looking for uh, taking our deacon nominations, and so please get those forms turned in. We know that that's a very important job. The job of a deacon is very important. There are many men among us who have the ability to, to uh, serve in that capacity, and so we want to get that started real soon, as too, soon too. Also, uh, coming up in March, March will be our first, first fifth, I did it again, our first fifth Sunday. There's four of them this year. And uh, so wanted to make sure you know about our special contribution on our fifth Sunday is going to be to have a concrete slab poured out behind the building in between our church and Matt's house uh, where we can have a little, uh, like Jerry calls it, a patio with a purpose. It's a chance for the, give the kids a play area where they don't have to be in the parking lot anymore when they run around and play. So be thinking about that, be praying about that as well, and uh, be praying for our new deacons who are going to take on the role. Uh, that, that's a very, impo very important job, and I look forward to not only uh, seeing the results, but also, here, but also working with the future deacons as well as I, much as I enjoy working with our deacons right now. Am I on? There I am. There I was. We'll figure it out. <clears throat> we have been going through um, each month, we, we kind of tackle three different things. And the first thing that we were, but it's all steamed, uh, since around, built around our call to discipleship. And so we've looked at verses that uh, we all should, Bible verses that we all should take apart, take and take to heart and, and, and really not only memorize and mark in our Bibles, but put them on our heart and use them for ourselves as well as uh, learning and trying to uh, help others understand what it means to be a disciple. That's what we're going to be looking at all year long. It's what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And I hope that you are getting a lot out of these uh, uh, lessons and these sermons. I know I have learned a lot about um, the things that uh, when I'm planning on this stuff. Uh, this Today we're going to be looking at another disciple, one of the twelve. Um, it's very important for us to, 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 I think, to know about the twelve to know their background, to know where they came from, to uh, learn how they came to understand and what, what it means to be a part of Christ, be a part of the, the follower of Jesus. And the one that we're going to talk about today is, well, he's very popular. Um, he's the one who's, who outlived uh, the rest. He's the only one, according to the traditions, died of, of old age, exiled to the Isle of Patmos. You know, John, John was called, referred to himself in his own book, in the book, in the first book of First John, he referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. And we're going to get into a little bit of that toward the end. But you know, as I was looking through John and reading about John and, and some of the events where John was involved in, I got to noticing some things about John that, <clears throat> well, I could relate to. I mean, here's a guy who the majority of his books and the things that he writes about and the things that he talks with Jesus about all center around this idea of love. And we, you get this idea that in some ways, in some, in, some, in some ways, love, the way John talks about it and the way Jesus talks about it, it's very overwhelming to, the, to, the, to, to, to a Christian who says, you know, I'm doing good just to love my neighbor how 
how am I supposed to love the Lord with all my heart, soul, and mind and strength? I mean, this kind of love that's being talked about, it's great and it's huge and I don't know if I can reach it. But then if you go back and you look at John and his transitions through his life, you can almost follow his life by his titles, if you will. Many people have referred to John as... uh, of course, John. Some people, some religions, refer to him as John, John the Divine, or John the Theologian. John, like I said before, the, the the disciple that Jesus loved. John the Revelator. We all know that John. You know, John was was part of the writing. John was the author of the Book of Revelations. And some people refer to him as John of Patmos, where he was exiled to. But only one person gives John a unique name. As uh, Janus read this afternoon about when the when Jesus came and called him, we, we see where where Jesus just got through calling Peter and Andrew, and then he's walking down a little more ways, and he sees two brothers in the boat working alongside their dad. Don't know how, what he says. Don't know how he calls them. You know, I like to speculate that Jesus kind of said the same thing to James and John as he said to Peter and Andrew, hey, come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Doesn't say what he said, but it was, it was important enough and it was powerful enough for James and John to literally stop what they were doing, get out of the boat, leave their father, and follow Jesus. So we're going to look so John in his many titles. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus calls the twelve, and he calls them in, and he, and he gives them uh, a job. He gives them, because you, you guys are going to be my guys, he says. You're going to be my disciples. You're going to be my apostles. And so, and, the, and there's the list of the names, and Jesus calls the twelve men to be apostles, and among them are James and John, the sons of Zebedee. But Jesus gives them another nickname. Another name. Boranages. Boranages means sons of thunder. Now when you think about that, what's the, I mean, you know, some of the little kids and the kids in junior high and high school, when you hear sons of thunder, you might think about the, the Marvel comic book character Thor, you know, who's walking around with this big hammer and every time he hits it, you know, lightning bolts strike out of the hand. We can see evidences of how John lives up to his nickname. You know, we pick on, well, I pick on, I don't know if we pick on, say we pick on Peter, but, you know, we, we give a lot of reference to Peter and how Peter is the apostle or the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth. You know, bless his heart, Peter always says the wrong things at the most inopportune time, he, he, you know, he blurts out things that he later rich wishes he hadn't said. Jesus is always being, but you know what? John is pretty close to second. With some of the things that him and, him and his brother James think of, it's no wonder he's called born of Jesus, son of thunder. Now, it's interesting in the, in, in when, 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 when the Jewish people tell stories or write stories, or when you follow stories along in the Bible, you, gotta pay, you pay attention to the fact that a lot of times they go, uh, how they are listed is very important, and, it's, and it's, it can broke, be broken down in so many ways. But in many ways, you will understand that when they're listing family relatives, anytime they're siblings, anytime they're siblings, the oldest one's first. So if the Bible were writing about Joe's kids, who say Joe and Lori, and then there was Joe, Braden, Joshua, and Isabel, Bella. That's the kind of thing. Thing. So it's easy to understand how James was the little brother to John. To uh, John, excuse me, was the little brother to James. John was always probably looking it up, following his big brother James around. 
The ironic thing about that whole thing is, is the fact that James was considered the first disciple to lose his life. In that, in a, in a, traditionally in the, in the group of 12, we can read about that in Acts, but John outlives them all. How fascinating is that? How interesting it is that John has this long life and the way that he goes through his life tries to downplay his nickname, Son of Thunder, to become a disciple of love. And here's the, here's the thing about it. When Jesus, well, Jesus does things, he does them for a reason. And Jesus has a purpose for everything he does. So he must have had a very good reason for dubbing his, for John and his, brother, and his brother the sons of thunder. Turn over to John chapter 2. There's two little verses. In, in John chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, that John kind of maybe can give a hint into why Jesus does what he does. He calls himself in John the disciple that Jesus loved. It's only done about four times in the book of John. And while we could talk about that a whole lot, I think we can easily understand that, well, Jesus loved all of his disciples. But John chose to give, him that, give himself that name. But look at John chapter 2, verses 24. But Jesus would not trust himself to them. For he knew all men. Verse 25. He did not need man's testimony about man. For he knew what was in a man. Did you pick up on that? Jesus knew what it is, what's in a man. And we see that time and time again where, you know, the Pharisees are thinking some things or saying some things under their breath or the disciples, we're going to read about a, where the disciples are mumbling and grumbling. Jesus knows what they're talking about, what they're grumbling about, but he asks them anyway. Jesus knows what is in man. If, we, if Jesus knew what was in a man, then he knew what was in John. And so in a lot of ways, you can see that John, while he was given the nickname Baranages, son of thunder, Jesus knew that inside of John was an understanding about love that would transcend so many levels in so many ways. In one, vivid, in one vivid incident, we see John, uh, po uh, John possessed some of those thunder-like qualities. Jesus and his disciples were traveling through Samaria on their way to, to, to Jerusalem, and they run into a little problem. In Luke chapter 9, starting, about ver starting in verse 51, it says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent a messenger on ahead who went to a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people did not welcome him because he was heading, excuse me, because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, this is pretty neat, you know, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? And Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. Now, play this out in your head. There's 12 of them, and they're walking down the road. They got a guy going ahead, and the guy comes back, and they says, Jesus, the Samaritan, they don't want any part of you. They don't want you to welcome you. And Jesus is like, well, hmm, okay, let's go to plan B. But behind him are his two brothers. Let's call down fire from heaven. Let's wipe them out. And I can just, just shut up. We don't do that. Now, we don't know if they had that ability or that power. I don't think they did. But they thought they did. They thought they had that power and ability. 
It was like, we can do these kind of things. Why? Because we're the sons of thunder. We have this power. It's almost like they wanted to be known for something different than who they were. Like being fishermen, being a fisherman was just, nah, that's my side job. My important job, though, is that because I'm a son of thunder, I make noise. I let people know who's in charge. There's a song of saying that we all we all know around here. Thunder's just a noise. Lightning does the work. What are you more afraid of? Thunder or lightning? Well, when we're little, we get scared of the thunder. Lightning has the power. Now put that in context with what John's name is. You see, now when we hear thunder, oh, hey, it's going to rain. The storm's coming. Maybe we need to take some precautions. Maybe we need to do some things. Maybe we just need to sit outside and watch the rain come. Are you getting this parallel here? Are you understanding what it means? What John and his many titles John and his brother's response to the Samaritans reveals a, a, a fervent, impetuous and, and, and anger that, prop, that could probably give them the name of why they are the way they are. Thunderous. And we can be sure that there were other times that James and John lived up to their nickname. Mark chapter 10 Starting in the verse about 35, there's another story that involves James and John. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 35, it says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Wow. That's kind of a way to, a way to enter, start a conversation with, with the Lord. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And we're going to stop right there. James and John had a desire for a position of power. That would and, and it would realize if only they were willing to submit to servanthood, would they actually get any kind of standing amongst Jesus' followers? I mean, to sit at your right and your left sounds like a a a a, turn, a way to understand a position of power and prestige. But notice what Jesus asked him he, in verse, in verse uh, 38. He says, can you drink the cup I drink? And In, in, in Jewish times, that's what an, ex, an expression. It was a terminology that they understood, which means, will you, are you willing, can you share the fate that I'm about to face? Of course, the cup Jesus had to drink refers to the divine punishment on sin that he bore for the redemption of everyone. And Jesus said it, but Jesus goes on to say, it's not for me to decide. It's not for me to grant. Because ultimately, Jesus would not usurp His Father's authority. Look at verse 41. Then the ten heard this, they became indignant in the, with James and John. Well, I can imagine. That, I, would, I would be a little upset too. Here are the two thunder boys trying to get in and rub elbows with Jesus so they can have a little more position and authority. The rest of them were really upset about this. And, I can, and, so, and so Jesus called them all together. Look at what he says. He says, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Verse 43, Not so with you. And I can imagine when he said that, he looked right at the two thunder boys, the thunder sons of thunder, and said, whoever wants to be first must be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
Now we all know how close John was with Christ. John, along with Peter and Andrew, were a part of that inner circle. When anything was going on with them, it was always Peter and Andrew and James and John were in that inner circle when it happened. You can read about that in Matthew 17. James and John were two of Jesus' closest friends. But then we see a transition. Maybe as the time went by and John hung out with, with Jesus more, he realized that that nickname wasn't a nickname that he really should be proud of. And so John moves past his desires, the desire of position and the desire of prestige and desire to, to live up to his nickname, but to move past that, which is what we read about. And so finally, John gets the idea of, well, maybe this is something new. This is something different. So John becomes, John starts focusing on one word. And it runs through everything he writes about. In the Gospel of John, in John 1, John 2, and John 3, even though they're very short, there are passages in all four of these books that give a really good, hard understanding of what Jesus was trying to accomplish. John 3, 16 and 17. We talked about this last Sunday. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, but whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17 is equally important. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. That is the, some people could say that's the center of the Gospel of John. Yes, there was the Word, and the Word became flesh. It, John has been known to be called the, the, the description, how he describes Jesus as, as this cosmic being, and how it's, you know, it, it, you read the book of John, the Gospel of John, and you can see how different it is from the other three. But in the end, it all goes back to love. 1 John 4, 7 through 11, Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And this is how He showed love among us that He sent His, His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. Hmm, that sounds familiar. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and, hence, and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Second John chapter 1, 5, and 6. And now, dear lady, and when he says dear lady, I happen to believe that he's referring to the church in general, the church body that meet that he's writing to. He's saying, now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command but one we have had had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love. You want to know what love is? This is it. That we walk in obedience to His commands. As you have heard from the beginning, His command is that you walk in Love. Hmm. Third John, chapter one, the only chapter, five through eight. Now this gives a new little trend. This is this is this is a little different, but if you really pay attention, you can find what he's talking about. So, dear friends, you are faithful in what you are doing. For, for the brothers, even though they are strangers to you, they have told the church about your love. And you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. And we ought therefore show hospitality to such men, 
so that we may work together for the truth. So whatever this young man was doing, it was being bragged about in the church. They told the church about your love. As the church started to... It started in its infancy in Acts. Tradition tells us, and the, the book of Acts tells us, that John was the last to die. And although of old age, John's epistles were written late in his life, which is kind of a hint that he, man, he still possessed that, that fervent spirit, that thunderous emotion, that thunderous attitude. In a lot of ways, if you go back and read some of what he writes later, you can still see that brand of Jesus coming out in him. I mean, he gets excited. A lot of exclamation marks in his writings. Especially in his disunification, especially when he talks about the, the disunification. And, uh, and, and when he talks about people who are deceivers, man, he gets really fired up. You can, John, 1 John 2, 22, 2 John 7, 3 John 10. However, that fiery tempered all came down. And as it cooled down, and as, that, and as it cooled off, all you can see is it all comes from a love. A love for Christ. An admiration for Him and only Him. First, the, the words of 1 John says love, and it's, it's, it, it, it even, love is used over 40 times in its books. So when John first meets Jesus, John was one of the thunder boys. But after walking with Jesus for the lifetime, and I wrote that, when I wrote that down, I thought, I need to correct that because, you know, Jesus, he didn't walk with Jesus for Jesus' lifetime, but I thought, no, wait a minute, Bland, that's right. John walked with Jesus for John's whole lifetime. The Son of Thunder earned a new nickname. He was the Apostle of Love. So what does that mean for us? It all goes back to that little verse that we looked at in the beginning. Jesus knows men. He knew what was in their hearts. Many of us here have nicknames. Some have been given to us by our parents. Some have been given to us by our friends. Some are the nicknames we don't necessarily like or care for. Maybe they bring back a time of in their life when you were rebellious or angry or whatever. Some of them are just funny nicknames that you don't mind talking about. I could tell you plenty about me. But Jesus knows each and every one of your hearts, inside and out. If you were to meet Jesus physically, because you know how I feel about this, any time, any person reading God's Word comes in contact with Christ, we have seen it time and time again. Any time you come in contact with Jesus, you are changed one way or the other. When some people come in contact with Jesus, they wind up hating Him. Their hearts get hard and they set out from day one trying to figure out how they can kill Him. Some come in contact with Jesus and yes, they have a thundery, fiery temper. And yes, they want to call down fire from heaven when the people are being ugly to Him and mean to Him and they want to do whatever. They follow Him to the end. Some people come in contact with Jesus and have a relationship so strong that they're part of the inner circle. Some get to the point that the relationship with Christ is so strong that when Jesus is hanging on the cross, Jesus looks down and sees John and sees His mother. He says, Woman, behold your son. What kind of name would Christ give you? And what kind of name 
Do you strive to be come as a follower of John, a follower of Christ?